Good morning, everyone. Certainly good to see all of you here this morning. As you were singing the last part of that song, did it remind you of, of Bill Crowley? Yeah, <laughs> I miss that so much, being able to see our song leaders up here leading and singing. They do such a wonderful job, but it's so good to see each and every one of you and to be able to be able to gather together with one another in person and have a worship service. And though a number of our brethren are still at home streaming the services live and some are back in our remote service, it's still good just to be able to uh, join our hearts together either physically or certainly spiritually. It's always a, a great blessing uh, for us. So good morning. So glad that you are, are present. There are two big events that I want to uh, bring to your attention that's coming up for us as a congregation that is down the line. The first one is we're going to have a, a virtual prayer summit on October the 18th. We're going to spend an hour or so uh, uh, praying for our families, praying for our, our congregation and our country and all the various facets that make up our, our prayer life. And so October the 18th, you might start setting that aside. Depending on where we are, in, uh, where we are in coming together with one another, we might be doing it virtually. It could be that we might be able to do it physically, but right now we're planning virtually to do it through a Zoom kind of meeting. And so uh, virtual prayer summit October the 18th. The second big event is going to happen uh, sooner. We're going to have a campfire devotional right here on our South parking lot. Uh, September the 27th, we're going to do some singing and some praying. We're going to listen to a devotional lesson, a lot of fellowship, and then, of course, some more. So bring a lawn chair and a, a, a happy spirit. I was going to say a smile, but we might be a mask. I don't know. But anyway, that's going to be a good time as we kind of round out the summertime together with one another and being able to be together for this campfire uh, devotional. So I'd encourage you to be a part of that. Well, uh, several weeks, uh, several months ago, actually at the beginning of the year, I introduced to you a theme. And so if you're visiting us for the first time or if you're for the first time on a live stream, I've been sharing with our congregation a theme. And the theme is identity, embracing our true nature taken from uh, 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 3 through about verse 15, but in particular verses 5 through 7. As we've been talking about these things, your, your identity is so important to who you are and what uh, you are. Our identities are, are important, so at the beginning of the year, and then engaging about five minutes later after the pandemic, uh, we began talking about our identity. And I share with you a number of analogies that identify you as an individual. So we talked about our fingerprints as a way of identifying us individually. We talked about passports, our identity that allows us to come and go, certainly out of the United States and into other countries. We talked about our driver's license. Our driver's license identifies the fact that we have the privilege of being able to drive on the roads in the United States. And so those are some analogies that talk about who we are and how we are individually uh, set apart from those around us. This morning, I want to share with you another analogy, one that allows us to stand out in the world as Christians, and that is branding and identity. Branding is important. Branding is important to places like, or to things like companies or businesses or organizations or individuals or various kinds of product. Branding is so important. It's a, it's a visual identifying mark of, of the product you have, uh, what people think of you, how they perceive you. Branding is something like that that is important, and we, you see it all around you. If you were to just to go out on the streets and drive up and down the road, you'll see different kinds of brandings on billboards. You'll see it in storefronts. You will see it on the, on the Internet if you get much on it. You'll, you'll see branding everywhere that separates that company or organization or individual from other companies, businesses, and organizations and, and individuals. Branding is that kind of thing that it really is important. In fact, when you think about branding, behind me are a number of brands, and as you look at them, probably you're going to be able to recognize what they are right off the bat. Obviously, the Apple is Apple. Mercedes-Benz, LG is an electric country, McDonald's, uh, Nike, Android. I don't know what that one is or to your right, bottom right, Facebook, and then a General Electric. Or maybe here's some more, uh, a Twitter or the bullseye is Target or Pepsi or the Olympics. You have Shell, which is an oil company. And then, of course, there is Batman that, you know, is, is there for people to see. When you talk about individuals, well, the guy on my right with the basketball, that is Jordan's image. When you see that, you know you're talking about Air Jordan. And then the guy in the middle is, of course, Mickey Mouse. 
And then as Lori said, so what's this other one over here? Well, it's, it's Mick Jagger. So anyway, those are symbols. When you see them, you know of them as individuals, and you're able to see that they stand out from other individuals or other uh, personalities. We as a country have a national brand that is known around the world. So when anyone sees the red, white, and blue and the stars that are there, they know exactly what country it is that causes that country to stand out from other countries around. So you have the flag as a national symbol. Even when it comes down to Christianity or the Christian religion, there are a number of brands that are out there that causes us to stand out from other religious entities. And if you were to think of what they are, you would think automatically as the cross. The cross causes us to stand out. Or the ichthus, the, the fish. It, these are brands, if you will, or analogies that causes us to stand out from the world who is around us. So brand identity is the way you want folks to perceive you versus the brand image, the way people uh, actually perceive you. And so it is a mental picture or a visual picture that is put out there that becomes obvious to those around you. Well, our true nature is our brand that communicates to the world around us that we are devoted to, uh, to God and not devoted to other things. We may get caught up in other things, but at the end of the day, where we really are to be voted, that which really brands us or sets us apart is our devotion to God. And so Peter knows this. And so over in 2 Peter, the uh, first chapter, beginning in verses 5 through 7, he begins to go down through a number of qualities. There are seven qualities that are there. We've already looked at four of them. And the first quality that brands us as Christian is moral excellence. It's the ability to choose to do what is right in the face of peer pressure. Whether you're talking about peer pressure from society or whether you're talking about peer pressure from your friends or from the culture in which you live, we are to choose that which is right according to God's standard, which leads next to embracing a knowledge, knowing what is right and knowing what is wrong. God has, through his standard or moral code, has identified those things that are right for us to do and those things that are wrong, those things that are, that are holy and those things which are not holy. And, and, and so you get the idea of a knowledge. The other one was self-control, embracing self-control. It stops us from doing wrong things and keeps us doing what is right. So self-control is extremely important to us. And then two weeks ago, I talked to you about uh, perseverance, which I said to you was the queen of all uh, virtues. It, perseverance, being able to endure, being able to be steadfast, to hang in there, no matter what kind of turmoil is going on around you, you're able to persevere, to stay strong like a, a bedrock. Well, this morning I want to share with you a fifth quality, a fifth brand that causes us to stand out, and that's godliness. In fact, I would submit to you that it's the driving force behind all the Christian qualities. Without godliness, we probably are not going to be able to do the moral excellence thing. We're not going to pursue knowledge. We're not going to uh, practice self-control or even perseverance or any number of things in our lives. This godliness is a driving force for what we are as Christians and these qualities. So Peter is telling us as Christians that if you want your life to be profitable, his words would be useful or fruitful in this world in which we live, then we are to embrace uh, this quality of godliness uh, to our lives. Well, the question that comes to our minds then is what exactly is godliness? Well, open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and notice verses 7 through 9, because in this section he's going to talk about a godliness here. Here's what he says. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline, train, exercise yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds a promise for the present life and also in the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. So he talks about godliness here. Now, what you may see or you may not see is that in the scriptures, when Peter talks about godliness, uh, he uses it like four times. In verse 3, in verse 5, and then in verse 6. And later on in verse, chapter 3 and verse 11, he's going to use the word godliness. Paul, in his epistles, he uses it like 11 times. 
And so godliness really is a focal point, at least to some degree, within the scriptures. But it's used minimally. And even though it is used minimally in actuality, in the Bible, well, godliness is what life is about. In fact, the Bible is all about godliness or moving us towards uh, godliness. So it becomes an important word uh, to us. And so what is a godliness? What does it mean to be a godly individual? Well, over the years, I've asked different people, what is godliness to you? What does it mean to be a godly person? And people come up with all kinds of information or idea about what a godliness is. Some say, well, you know, godliness is, you know, it's being godlike. A godliness is being Christ-like. Or they might say godliness is applying the fruit of the Spirit into our lives. That we are to have it within our lives, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control and those things. And, and, and those are all part of the Christian character uh, of, what, of who we are. But when you talk about godliness, it's much more than that. All the things that you see behind me, that's talking about Christian character or Christian behavior or maybe what we should be doing. But godliness is much more than just those things. Because it's possible for you to be loving and joy-filled. It's possible for you to be self-controlled. It's possible for you to be uh, gentle or, or patient. It's possible for those things to be a part of your life and you not be dedicated to God or want anything to do with, with God. There's a lot of people who are extremely moral that are out there in the world who don't do so because of their relationship with God. But when you talk about God, godliness, it's more than godlikeness or Christ-likeness. There's something that is a driving force behind those things. In the Bible, it gives us a number of, what I would say, clues to what godliness is. For instance, in Genesis, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 24, there Moses, as he, he writes there, uh, he writes is the character of a man by the name of Enoch. And when he talks about Enoch, Enoch was a special person. And in, in Genesis 5 and verses 21 through 24, it says that uh, Enoch was godly. And because of the way he walked with God, he was not because God took him. So Enoch walked with God. The writer of Hebrews later on in what is called the Hall of Faith, there he talks about a number of individuals, but one that stands out to him is Enoch. But he sees him in a different way than Moses did back in Genesis 5. In Genesis 5, he says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, uh, for God took him. And then Hebrews 11 and verse 5 says that Enoch was pleasing to God, that God took him because he pleased God. So when you take those two and you put them together, you begin to see something. You begin to see something that stands out in your mind. You begin to see that Enoch's life was centered in God, that God was the, his very focal point that is the pole star of his very existence. It was, he was constantly present in the mind of Enoch, so much so that he says Enoch walked with God. Enoch was pleasing to God, and because of that, God took him. That's how special this uh, man was. So we could, I believe, accurately say that when you talk about Enoch, he was devoted to God, and that's the meaning of godliness. When someone says, what is a simple definition of godliness, the simple definition of godliness is devotion to God. That's all godliness is. It's a lot. But, it, but that's the driving force behind all the Christian qualities or the uh, brand qualities that we have already, already mentioned, and that's devotion uh, to God. Devotion to God is the mainspring, uh, mainspring of godly character. It's where it emanates from. So godliness is more than just Christian character. It is devotion to God that results in a godly character. Listen, a person can be a, a super conscientious a parent. They can be a devoted worker at a, a job. They can be a, 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 a wonderful uh, minister within a congregation. 
They can be a very good speaker in a congregation. They be, can be sold out to ministry in a congregation, but not be devoted to God. There might be another driving force behind why they do those things, but it may not have anything to do with devotion. But devotion to God will always come out or summarize itself in that of godly character. So it's devotion to God that motivates us to be morally excellent. It's devotion to God that makes us grow in knowledge. It's devotion to God that causes us to practice self-control. It's, it's devotion to God that causes us to persevere in the midst of trial or difficulty or obstacles in our lives. It's devotion to God that causes us to be good husbands and good wives. It's devotion to God that causes us to be good parents. It's devotion to God that causes us to be hard workers at our job for our employers. It's, you see what I'm saying? Devotion to God drives our character and who we are and what we are. So when you summarize it, godliness is more than just Christian character. It is character that springs from devotion to God. But it's true, also true that devotion to God always results in godly character. So do you see how, um, how we kind of blend them together and why godliness becomes important to us? This word sebomai or eusebomai sometimes is even referred to as worship. There's like four words for worship in the scripture, but one of them is eusebomai or eusebomai, and it means a devotion that is given to God. So when we gather together, why is it that we come to church? We come to church because we're devoted to God. You can come to church and not be devoted to God. You can be involved in ministry and not be devoted to God. You can be a preacher and not be devoted to God. But those who are devoted to God give them very, their, very, their very self to that uh, in terms of their character. Then Paul talks about pursuing godliness. Look at verse 7 of chapter 4 but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, not only in this world, but that which is to come. And so he talks about the pursuit of, of godliness. The word pursuit indicates an unrelenting, uh, per persevering effort. That means you really are moving toward it and going after it the word itself well i'll talk about the word itself in a moment here but it means there's got to be work in it when he says discipline or exercise or train yourself towards godliness what he's telling you is that godliness doesn't just happen godliness doesn't come by osmosis godliness is not a quick fix thing it's not like you know instant pudding or instant potatoes or anything instant where, or, or instant coffee where you just zap it or you just whip it up. Godliness doesn't happen that way. Godliness takes effort. It takes discipline. It takes energy. It means you got to work toward being a godly person. It means it has a sustained effort that is involved in it. The word that he uses here for discipline or exercise or train uh, is the word gumnazo. It's kind of a cool word when you think about gymnazo. I think in the, I think in the uh, New King James Version, he uses the word exercise. In the NIV, it uses train. And then in the New American Standard, it's the word discipline that he uses. But he uses this word gymnazo. The word gymnazo is where we get our English word gymnasium from. And so it's talking about a place of exercise or a place of getting fit or getting in shape. And so originally it had to do with your body, getting your body in, in shape. Actually, the word means naked, exercising naked. Or is that naked? Anyway, uh, anyway, that's what the word means, but it came to mean more than that. It came to go beyond just disciplining or exercising your physical body. It came to be disciplining your mind or working with your mind, growing in your mind. So the purpose was to become what God wants us to to be and paul says it's not going to just happen you're going to have to discipline yourself towards being devoted to god why is that because there's going to be things that are going to pull at you from different directions the world's going to pull at you from one direction your friend's going to pull at you from another direction society's going to pull culture is going to pull you look at our world today and you see we're being pulled from all different directions well you have to really discipline yourself to stay 
tuned in with God and devoted to God. Godliness, then, is profitable for all things. So what are the things that godliness is profitable uh, for or, or to? Well, one is it promotes a peaceful lifestyle. Let's just look at 1 Timothy. Look at, if you will, at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Verse 1 says, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in authority in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Did you see what he says? He says that we are to pray for those who are in authority. I love Dave's prayer this morning because he talked, uh, you know, he, he interceded on behalf of our nation and those who are in places of authority so that we can live a godly life, so we can stay devoted to God. And the result is, is that we have a peaceful or a tranquil lifestyle. So godliness is something that leads to peace in our lives or tranquility in our lives as opposed to what we see going around us in the world. As Dave mentioned, when you watch the TV or read, look at the Internet or if you read the newspaper or, or any other kind of media that you can think of, you see a world that seems to be coming apart at the seams. You see uh, terrorism, you see anarchy, you see riots in the street, you see uh, things being torn up and burned down, you see people even being killed uh, now. And you're caused to think, well, where does that come from? How is that happening? Is that happening because of uh, society is itself, itself? Is it happening because it's pol political? Is it happening because of genderism? Is it happening because of culturism? What is it that's causing this to happen? Well, you can lay blame at all those things, but I would submit to you that it all stems from one place, and that's ungodliness. When people are not devoted to God, they become devoted to other things. Humans become devoted to themselves, and we can be pretty stingy about things. We can be pretty into ourselves, caring only for ourselves. But the scripture teaches us that we're not to be that way in our lives, so it promotes a peaceful lifestyle. It, per, it, it uh, promotes true, uh, the true value of femininity. I mean, look at verse 10, actually verse 9 and 10. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as benefits a woman that makes a claim to godliness. And so in our world today, it's so easy to get caught up with fad and, and fashion and, and beauty and think that that's where we need to be. So we get caught up in making sure that our bodies are sculpted uh, right, uh, that we are re wearing, you know, the certain right kinds of makeup and, and jewelry and, and clothes that either are revealing or unveil unveiling. We can get caught up in that kind of thing. And what Paul says, is he says, don't get caught up in that stuff. Get caught up in, in things that really matter, which is, he says, is an inside of a woman that makes her beautiful. Okay. And he says, godly works that is befitting that of godliness or devotion to God. Now, ladies, did you hear me say that you shouldn't wear makeup or jewelry or that your clothes should not make you look nice? I didn't say that. I'm simply saying that that's not your goal. Your goal is the hidden person inside you that becomes that which is beautiful and emanates on the outside. It gives clarity in uncertain a times chapter 3 and verse uh, 16 by common confession great is the mystery of of godliness and so it helps us to stay uh, centered it leads to uh, contentment first timothy 6 and i believe it is verse 7 there it says godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment and he's using it in in opposition to to wealth where people in the world says listen if you climb the corporate ladder if you buy the right things, if you attain a lot of, of money, then you're going to be a, a happy person. If you say that my goal is to be uh, beautiful, my goal is to be uh, successful, then let me tell you what, you're probably not going to be uh, happy. You probably won't be content. Why is that? Because you're in competition with a lot of other people. There's a, listen, for every one beautiful woman, there are two and three and four beautiful women. Have you ever seen any of this on, like, say, on the Internet, where it, says, it shows a picture of a woman and say, the most beautiful woman in the world? 
And you think, are you serious? Do you know how many beautiful women there are in the world? This is not the most beautiful woman in the world. Because I'll show them a picture of my wife then and say, I'll challenge you on that. Or this is the most sexy man in the world. You know, really? You think, you know, Clooney is the most sexy man in the world or whoever the other heartthrob is? There's always going to be a better or more sexy person than uh, you are or a person that is more successful or a person who has a bigger bank account. If you are an RVer and you go to an RV resort, I'm telling you that there's always a bigger and better RV that comes on the lot. And if you wait a day or two later, it's going to become even a bigger and better one. They go up to like 63 foot, some of them, you know, four and five slides in them, swimming pools in them almost anymore. I mean, it's crazy. The healthy things just get, get and, and, and that's not enough. They even have a big trailer on the back of it where they're hauling the Mercedes around in the thing. So, you, you, listen, you just never, godliness is a means of contentment. That's where the great gain is. It touches who you are on the end side of who you are, and it's always associated with, with truth. Titus 1 and verse 1. You get what I'm saying, I, I hope, that godliness is devotion. Uh, to God. Well, if there is godliness, then the opposite side of godliness is ungodliness. So here's some warnings and encouragement. Romans 1 and verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's a warning. There is a wrath that's coming. There is a comeuppance that is on the way and that he's letting us know that God is against all ungodliness. Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So on one hand, we're said, stay away from ungodliness. On the other hand, we're told to pursue godliness in our lives. So godliness is profitable, Paul says, for all things. There are other things that are of little profit. He says bodily discipline is of little profit. And that makes sense if you just think about it. I mean, when you were a young man or a young woman, you might have been cut. You might have had, you know, that perfect curve and all those things. You might have had muscles and, and, and that. But no matter how much you exercise or how much you walk, Something's going to get you in the end. Something's going to get you in the end. Something physical. So what he says, but godliness, it's profitable not only in this age, but in the age to come. So godliness will serve as well in this life. And it'll serve as well in that which is to come. So pursue those things. So add to your faith moral excellence, to your moral excellence knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, to your self-control perseverance, and to your perseverance devotion to God or godliness to God, and you'll be blessed because of it, and you will have a brand that sets you apart from the rest of the world. Think about what Jesus says. You are the light of the world. You're a brand that shines, and one of those brands are these qualities that sets us apart from our friends and neighbors. May God bless you as you consider the thoughts and while we stand and sing, give you opportunity to respond if you feel the need to do so at this time.